Hi Witchlings, welcome back to my channel. It is me, your local Chaotic Witch Aunt. And today, I'm talking about books that have helped me in my practice that are not witchcraft books. Uh, this was a suggestion via Instagram. If you're interested, I do often put little question bubbles on my Instagram asking what people want to see. I'll do it once a month or so. And I have a stack <laughs> of books. I have a couple different categories of books that have helped me in my practice, um, some of which pertain directly to Italian folk magic, and some are a little bit more general. But the kind of main genres of books are medicinal plants and herbalism, essays and works on animism and the environment, historical texts, and folklore, ethnographic, and anthropology studies. <laughs> so we're starting at the top. The first one that I have in this list falls under, this is uh, Essays on the Environment. Um, this is Spiritual Ecology, The Cry of the Earth. It is a collection of essays edited by Llewellyn Vaughn Lee. I also consider braiding sweetgrass to be considered like in this area on essays or books on the environment or even just essays and books not written by witches or kind of like spiritualists. Ooh, there's a fun dip in here. It's not fun dip, that's kind of sick. Or spiritualists as well as scientists, uh, but from outside of my spiritual tradition, Braiding Sweetgrass is a 100% book that I feel like a lot of people consider spiritual, and I consider it spiritual, but it is not written from inside witchcraft. It is written by an indigenous author. This book includes spiritualists that are not witches, indigenous authors, Buddhists, Christians, priests that are not witches, that talk about the present ecological crisis. I really like Spiritual Ecology. This was our book club book for the past month. It was, it's a, it was a great choice. Also, I really love Braiding Sweetgrass because it gave me, it was part of another book we read for book club, but very much focuses on uh, decolonizing in our view of the earth, animism, learning, how the way in which we view nature now is a capitalist and colonial sentiment and working to remove that from our understanding of nature. Braiding the Sweetgrass was like incredibly transformative for me in my practice as is spiritual ecology because as I'm reading it you know there are things that I didn't even consider and I also just even though this isn't how it toted as an anti-capitalist book it 100% is an anti-capitalist book. Like everyone in here is like Fuck those guys that came over and only saw nature as a tool and not an, a living thing. And I'm like, yes, yes. Shout out, spiritual ecology. I love this book. Books on the environment or books written by, and Robin Welkmerer is both a scientist and an indigenous author. So that kind of blending of both environmental uh, understanding through science and environmental understanding through animism. Chef's Kiss. That is the first kind of genre. And I, I rarely kind of find books in that category. I think that Braiding Sweetgrass was a book that really felt, I guess to me, like the first of its kind that I'd ever come across. And honestly, I would love other books from different traditions that discuss the same thing. So next we're on to, my books are falling, Anthropology, Ethnography, and Folkloric Texts. It's a lot. These are three examples that I have. And that is Magic, A Theory from the South by Ernesto Di Martino. Uh, Power and Magic in Italy by Thomas Hauschild. Hauschild? Hauschild? And Italian American Folklore by Francis M. Alpezzi and William M. Clements. So all three of these books have to do with Italian folk magic. And so I discovered the fact that ethnographers, anthropologists, and folklorists will literally just collect the information that pertains to Italian American folk magic, including methods, superstitions, beliefs, etc., and put them in books. And a lot of times you can get these works for free. If you email a academic and you're like, can I have your work for free? They're like, yeah. 
I love that. So magic, a theory from the south, contains information specifically to Lucania. It is a little older, but it was a very transformative book. Talking about Lucanian magic, including binding, binding in Eros, magical representation of illness, childhood and binding, binding in mother's milk, storms, magical life, crisis and presence of magical protection, uh, dehistorifying the negative, Lucanian magic and magic in general, Lucanian magic and Southern Italian Catholicism. So academic books approach things from a standpoint that is just reporting on what they find. Like there are specific methods that they go through to collect this information and to keep themselves to an extent a neutral party to prove a thesis. And for me, that is so helpful because they are just reporting it as they find it and as it was told to them by their informants. Especially Power and Magic in Italy, I don't know if you can see how many little post-it notes I have. In here, I found references to a wart cure, magic and bands, like, like uh, ribbons, coffin nail curses and protection, borsaline antifatura, an antifatura spell, a death curse, uh, uses of blood, underwear, and coffin nails in Italian folk magic, a bone curse in Italian folk magic, prayer against disease, St. John's wart um, and discussion of it, gentian, center, and mallow, keep, to keep out witches, just in case, fernet branca, and also talking about uh, amaro bitters and the importance of them in Italian folk magic, St. Donato, different saints and saint practices. Magic, a theory from the South also talks about this. So power and magic in Italy is up there with, I was able to read on things that I never would have known because it had existed otherwise. I'm still kind of parsing through Italian American folk magic, but it's proverbs, songs, games, folk tales, food ways, superstitions, folk remedies, and more. The places I have kind of dog-eared before for right now include, uh, yeah, talking about Italian um, Americans and their relationships with saints, and then talking about what different saints are petitioned for. Devotion to the Virgin and the Saints involving home altars, candles, votive, votive candles. Just a note on like religious practices. Also talking about Malocchio how someone falls victim to Malocchio, different ways that people are in like a weakened condition and can be affected by Malocchio, how to respond to specific threats of Malocchio, including hand gestures, it's talking about different protective methods, crucifix, uh, scapulas. Scapulas are big, I don't know why. So this is just the folk superstition. There's also uh, esoteric healing formulas with where they're from, Sicilian, Calabrian, Companion for healing the evil eye. Different methods of healing the evil eye, monsters in Italian folk magic, luck, and then folk medicine. Talking about a bunch of different ways in which folk medicine happens, the folk pharmacopoeia, including Italian-American folk magic and different things, fried onions, magical healing, talking about, even in here, curse. This really just like an example of a curse that someone did in here. Stories and storytelling, the life cycle and customs, so yeah, this entire book has so much in it and I'm very excited to dive into it. I consider it one of these kind of ethnographic, anthropological, where an academic went into a community separate from the community and received and gathered information about the community. While not everyone may be looking for books on Italian American folk magic and folk medicine, there's a very good chance that studies like this and books like this exist in the culture you are working to reconnect to and or in a culture you are curious about. It's just a matter of finding them. This one was new. I didn't even find this Italian American folklore until recently when a friend recommended it to me. So it takes a while. I've been studying Italian American folk magic and been a practitioner for around two years now. And I just like found this a month ago. So it takes a while, but looking up studies and oftentimes using the terminology like vernacular healing tradition, oral healing tradition, folk medicine, folk magic are typically used when referring to traditions like this. 
Next up is historical texts. This is also a new book that I found. This is the Trotula, an English translation of, mini and of the medieval compendium of women's medicine. But a lot of times I consider these primary sources of historical writings that can include mythologies, it can include compendiums, it can include a wide variety of things. I do often look for like primary sources when it comes to historical texts. This is edited and translated because it was not originally in English. It's from the Middle Ages. So this is University of Pennsylvania Press. So this is documenting the Trotula of Salerno, which is uh, notably the first woman gynecologist and her writings on women's health in Salerno. Um, so some of the things that I have bookmarked are compound medicines, in, in, I'm not necessarily gonna go and make these compound medicines because sometimes they're like, it's just like a, like wild things are in here. But it does help me understand the ways in which herbs that I work with were used historically as well as how I can work with them medicinally and magically in today. And um, even though not everyone's gonna be seeking out something like that, historical texts especially when they're primary sources. So thinking like the Greek uh, magical papyri, mythologies that are translated. Uh, so like the Odyssey, all of these, you can garner something, whether that is information on a deity, information on herbs, information on the history of medicine using herbs that you have a relationship with. Historical and primary sources almost always have something that can benefit us. I also like to read a lot of poetry. <laughs> poetry, I read Dante's Inferno and I'm like, yay, Dante. Uh, so I kind of go for that as well. This is one example, like I said, of a historical source that I will use. The Greco-Roman Magical Papyri is another one. Something like Ovid, the Odyssey is another one. But in your tradition, you may be seeking different types of primary sources and historical documentation, and they are very helpful to your practice. And last genre are books on herbalism. I'm aware that not everyone is seeking out herbalism or studying folk medicine and folk herbalism, but for me, these were incredibly helpful because in my practice in Italian American folk magic, folk medicine and herbalism are very much intertwined. There are a lot of things that were done for like malocchio that end up like we still use, like chamomile as a cure for certain things and it still has health benefits to this day. So when I am looking through these books, what I am looking for are is information on the energetics of an herb that will help me both medicinally and magically work with the herb. Because a lot of Italian folk magic, and I learned this in my class with the Root Circle, it can be very much informed by the four humors of like ancient Greek, Roman philosophy. When we look at that, we can very much understand our experiences with an herb through those energetics, um, both spiritually and physically. So the two herbalist books I have here are the first one is Radical Remedies, this was recommended to me by my boss at the metaphysical store that I look at, um, who is a herbalist. Thank you, Nathaniel. And this goes over so much. I absolutely love it. I don't know if you can see how many. I have so much. And so I actually color coded it. I went through and looked at systems. So different types of systems and how herbalism is approached, theory, herbal allies, recipes, other herbs, and methods of kind of creating something like a syrup, a tea, etc. Radical Remedies is, um, it's just so good. It infuses self-care and empowerment. It also talks about uh, putting plant medicine into practice. It doesn't just tell you to take a certain herb to fix a problem. It also talks about lifestyle choices, which for me, as someone with like dietary restrictions is really big. So being able to like learn about lifestyle choices that will help my gut, help my immune system, as well as herbs that will kind of help with that is really big. Also talks about the ethics of foraging. There is an entire section talking about like the ethics you need to keep in mind for sustainability. Also, 
working with a trained herbalist. And that's just, the intro is just so good. Talking about starting where you are with herbal medicine, um, an elemental approach, knowing your constitution. Now we're getting into energetics. And there are so many herbs in here that are herbal allies for me. And even those that are not herbal allies or ancestral herbal allies, I am interested in seeking a relationship with. So I love this book. I think it's fantastic. It is very helpful when you're just kind of starting to look into herbalism and how it even works. And if you're like me, not financially or like physically able to seek out a herbalist license at this point, and you're just kind of experimenting with yourself and kind of working with your body to kind of explore herbal medicine, this is a great book for you. The next book that I have is Q, Gardener's Companion to Medicinal Plants. And this is an A to Z of healing plants and home remedies. I love this book for a couple reasons. One, it goes through so many different plants and gives you a picture as well as information on the parts used, traditional uses, and medicinal discoveries. I love the fact that it actually shows what the plant looks like, because if you're like me and someone's like Yarrow, I'm like, I don't even, I, mm. Peppered throughout this book are also recipes that can be done at home, and these recipes also show pictures. They show you the process for making what they're talking about, which for me is very big. So this is talking about yarrow, and then it talks about making a yarrow glycerin. Before we even kind of get into the book, it tells you tools you're going to need for the book and to make the recipes in the book. So now we have like 200 milliliters of water, 400 milliliters of vegetable glycerin. You will also need saucepan, scissors, measuring jug, sterilized wide neck jar with lid, square mousseline, funnel, and sterilized bottle with stopper. Um, talking and it just talks you through the process and this is only one recipe that you can do at home out of so many there are just so many so for someone who kind of is looking into experimenting with what you can make I would recommend this book it's also a really great compendium if you're looking up a plant uh, you can just kind of go in here and catnip catmint it goes a to z so you can find it in the back in the glossary go and learn about the plant a little bit i think that this is a great jumping off point for learning about a particular plant and maybe looking at the different ways things can be prepared but i really do recommend radical remedies because radical remedies has a whole section in the back just talking about different preparations and how to make them and how to approach them them and what they're good for. This contains a lot, a lot of herbs and herbal profiles as well as what certain herbs are good for, but it doesn't have the amount of herbs that this one does. So you could get them together. They're a nice pair. And so those are the kind of two herbal books I have. There are obviously a lot more herbalism books out there that I haven't yet explored. I recently found a book that was literally gigantic, like a textbook just talking about folk herbalism and community that I didn't buy, but it, like it, it's, it, it's out there. And so my favorite part about reading books on herbalism and learning about herbs through that lens is that it actually gives us information on how we spiritually work with herbs as well as physically. Um, one example of this is mullen. Mullen is really good for the respiratory system. It is a very wet plant. It's good for kind of respiratory health. It's why it's included a lot in a lot of herbal smokes. But mullen is also a plant that is known for tending to the heart space and helping someone heal through grief. So mullen kind of, you can, you know where it's working physically and also where it's working energetically probably has a little bit of a tie to that. And when we learn about energetics, it also tells us a little bit more about herbs as well. These are the books that I thought of off the top of my head. I don't think that these are all the books that could benefit you as a practitioner that are not considered witchy books, but I think that those kind of categories are a good place to start. They typically will have a lot more information that isn't necessarily found in witchy books because I you know me I wrote a big I wrote a witchy book I love a witchy book 
but they are often written from the author's personal gnosis. They aren't always as heavily researched as something academic, which is why I think that having access to and seeking out academic materials or folklore kind of studies, anthropology, sociology, as well as herbalism and books from different points of view and different traditions is a great way to kind of establish and work with your practice and expanding your practice and your knowledge outside of the sphere of witchy literature. There's definitely more. I mean, I, I'm sure that someone could read a philosophy book and really garner something from their spirit, like from that book that helps their spiritual practice. But this is just me personally and the books that I thought of when someone asked me to make this video. If you have a book that's not witchy or not in the witchcraft sphere, that really helped you in your practice, let me know. Drop it down in the comments because I'm always where well, I'm always ready to learn. You know I love learning. If you want, you can subscribe, like, turn the bell on, but absolutely no pressure. Remember to drink water and have a good rest of your day. Siate Benedetti. Focus, you little shit.